Ty Hart grew up in Almsville, Oregon. He was an upbeat and energetic guy. As soon as he graduated from high school, he signed up for the Marines. Last Christmas, he came home and said to his family, you know, my four-year tour is just about up. I'll be home soon. Then on January 14th of this year, the family got an ominous phone call informing them that a Marine helicopter had crashed just off the north of Honolulu and all 12 Marines had died. Ty was only 21 years of age. We never know how long we're going to live. We all hope to live full and healthy lives, 85, 90, 95 years, but we can't be sure. The average age of those killed in the Twin Towers and the terrorist attack in New York was 40. Over the last six weeks, I've conducted uh, three memorial services for a guy, one for a guy who was 39, one for a guy 64, and another guy for 64. All three died suddenly. The families had no time to prepare. So as I talked to the families uh, in shock and dismay, I found they were very interested in talking about what happens after we die. In many ways, it's too bad that dying is the last thing we do because it could teach us so much about living. So what happens after we die? Is that the end? Do we just put our body in some hole in the ground or sprinkle the ashes somewhere? Jesus tells a parable about death and what happens after we die. This is the first in a series of messages called, What Did Jesus Mean? Today I want to look at you, with you at what did Jesus mean about what happens after we die. Turn to Luke 16, 19 to 31. This is one of Jesus' famous parables where he makes a dramatic, you know, dramatic story to make a point and to get us thinking. The context for the parable is Luke 16, 13 to 14. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll <coughs> hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. Luke tells us the Pharisees loved money. Then he tells a story about a rich man and a poor man. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Uh, the rich man is dressed in uh, you know, very expensive clothes. They're purple signifying that they're from the east, uh, probably made out of silk. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, Lazarus is the only person in all of Jesus' parables that he gives a name. It means God helps. We find Lazarus lying down by the rich man's gate. He's covered with these hideous sores on his skin. He's so hungry he longs to eat the scraps of food that are thrown from the rich man's table. Uh, in Middle Eastern culture in those days they didn't use napkins so the rich would wipe their hands on pocket bread and then they would throw bits of bread for the dogs to eat. Lazarus set his sights on those bits of bread but he couldn't fend off the ravenous dogs so they would beat him to it and then they would lick his pus oozing sores. We flinch at the thought of it. Jesus was such a great storyteller. How could the wealthy man overlook the poor man Lazarus? I imagine he looked the other way when he would drive in in his magnificent carriage through his gate. After a while, he didn't even notice Lazarus at all. The narcotic of affluence had dulled his sensitivity to other people. Our sense of rightness is offended. We want to cry out, is there no justice? The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Both men died. There was a huge funeral for the wealthy man. Many people came to pay their respects. He was buried in a tomb above ground where wealthy are buried. Lazarus died alone. Few people even knew he was gone. In Hades, the Greek word New Testament writers often use for hell, 
where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Uh, We're astonished at the sudden reversal of these two men's fortune. Lazarus is taken to Abraham's bosom where the righteous go. And the rich man is taken to hell where they are judged. In early Jewish thought, uh, Hades was thought of as the place everyone goes after they die before judgment. But as the New Testament develops, we we see the writers gradually coming to the point of seeing that when we die... Believers go directly to heaven and non-believers directly to hell. Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Uh, Again, Jesus is such an amazing uh, storyteller. He's so vivid. This rich man's modest request shows how terrible was his torture. He would settle for a single drop of water from Lazarus' finger on his tongue. He had hell to pay. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And beside all this, between us and you is a great chasm that's been fixed so that those who want to go from here, from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. There's a gulf between heaven and hell. You can't pass from one to the other after you've died. The rich man is now in misery. Lazarus has now found comfort. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. He cries out, If you can't help me, at least send someone to warn my brothers, so they don't come to this terrible place. You can feel the anguish in his voice. We're moved with pity for this man that just a few minutes ago we were disgusted with. Yes, Abraham, send someone. Warn the brothers. We root for the guy. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Moses refers to the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. The prophets refer to all the prophets and the Psalms, basically everything else in the Old Testament. If it was an angel today, he would have said, they have the Bible. Read both the Old Testament and the New Testament. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. The rich man pleads, no, they won't listen to the Bible. I know them. They've gone to schools that have taught them that the Bible's not true. Like every university across our country, except the Christian schools. But send someone back from the dead, then they'll believe. Abraham knows better. Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. He says, no, if they refuse to listen to God's word, even a voice from the dead will not convince them. We're stunned. We're surprised. So this is the takeaway from the parable. So what does Jesus mean? This is one of Jesus' double-edged parables. That is, there are two stories. The first story is about a rich man and... Lazarus, a poor man, living side by side, and then they die, and they have a reversal of fortune. The second story is about the rich man asking for Abraham to send someone back from the dead to warn his five brothers, and his request is denied. In a double-edged parable, the emphasis is always on the second part. So this is the main point of the parable. Uh, the parable of the prodigal son is a double-edged parable. You have the first story is the story of a prodigal who goes away, wastes all his money, and then he comes back and asks forgiveness. But the second half of the story is about the older brother. He's mad that dad throws a party for him, this scoundrel brother. He's begrudging, and that's the emphasis in that one. So the denial of the request is the surprise of the parable and therefore the main point of the parable. Lazarus is not the main character of the story. This is a parable about six spiritually apathetic brothers. It serves as a warning to people living in wealth and ease, not concerned about God or death or what happens after we die, nor concerned about the poor and needy around them. What a parable for our time. Many of us are oblivious to spiritual matters, uninterested in God's word, 
unconcerned about our final destiny. What happens to us after we die? I said to some people before the first service this morning, I said, I was driving this morning to, to church and you know, it, was, it was early and there were lots of cars on the freeway. But I said, I don't think they were going to church. <laughs> death can teach us so much about life. I find in this parable five things death can teach us about life. First, death cannot be avoided. Uh, the rich man and Lazarus both died. Through all of time, the statistics have never changed. 100 out of 100 people dies. Death is a reality none of us will avoid. Uh, Al and Frank were two 90-year-old friends that had been friends all through their grade school years. They played baseball and softball together in high school and college. And uh, when Al got sick, Frank visited him every day. And one day... Frank said to Al, Al, can you do something for me? When you get to heaven, can you somehow get word back to me if there's softball there? (laughs) And Al says, Frank, you've been my friend all all my life. If there's any way I can do that, I will. Well, Al passed away, and a few nights later, there's bright light, and uh, Frank sits up in bed and and uh, all of a sudden, hey, Frank, who is it? It's Al. You can't be Al. Al died four days ago. Yeah, it's me. It's Al. Well, where are you, Al? I'm in heaven. And I got some really great news for you and a little bit of bad news. Well, what's the great news? Well, there's softball up here. And uh, all the buddies, our buddies that died before us, they're up here. And uh, we're playing together and we're all younger now. And it's, it's beautiful weather like this every day. It doesn't snow, it doesn't rain. And we can play all day and we never get tired. Frank says, man, that is way better than I ever hoped. That is great news. What's the bad news? You're pitching Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. The second thing death teaches us about life is that there is life after death some people think that when we die that's it that's what we're taught in high school and college there's no God things just evolved and when you die that's the end but Jesus tells us that the rich man and Lazarus were alive immediately after they died in heaven and in hell death did not destroy their identities their memories One of the most frightening aspects of hell is to spend an eternity remembering the choices we could have made here, but didn't. Death dashes that hope. The question is not, will we live forever? The question is, where will we live forever? There are only two destinations, heaven and hell. Uh, Most of us are not too comfortable talking about either one, especially hell. A guy asked a friend, he says, would you come to church with me and hear our new pastor? And, okay. So after the service, he said, well, what do you think of our new pastor? He's pretty good. What happened to your old pastor? Well, we asked him to resign because he was always telling us that we were going to hell. <laughs> he said, well, that's pretty much what your new pastor just told you today. He says, yeah, I know, but when the old pastor said it, he sounded glad. <laughs> so there's a town in Norway that's gets a lot of tourists, it's called Hell, Hell, Norway. And because of its name, you know, a lot of people visit there. And so a group of Lutherans from the United States traveled there. And and, uh, when they got through traveling there, they sent an email to their pastor and said, uh, hey, we just passed through Hell today and we're a little concerned. Everybody here seems to be Lutheran. (laughs) All right, some of you are Lutheran, that was a sting on you guys, all right? All right, so some people ask, why would God send people to hell? I get that question a lot, but it portrays a caricature of God. God does not send anyone to hell. In front of hell's gate is a man on a cross. Jesus Christ, who was sent by God to die to keep people from going to hell. 
To get into hell, one must ignore that, <clears throat> that man, squeeze past him. But it would have been immoral of God not to provide a place for those who do not want to be with him. Uh, heaven is for people who want to be with God. Hell is for those who choose otherwise. Hell is, one goes to hell by choice, his own. Hell is a place prepared for people who say, Jesus, I don't want anything to do with you. I want to run my own life. God, I don't want you interfering. God does not force people to spend eternity with him against their will. That explains why he made a heaven and a hell. Now, we experience a lot of good times in our lives. Uh, Jory and I experience a lot of good times, but we also have a lot of difficult times. I, I, said to her, I said to her this week, life is hard. When you're dealing with tough times, uh, knowing that there's eternal life helps us deal with those. Well, there, there will be another life when God will right all wrongs. Country Western singers Brooks and Dunn wrote a song called Believe in which a, a young country boy uh, strikes up a relationship with a, an older man down the street. And this man was in the Navy, and while he was in the Navy, his wife died and his uh, son died. And so the little boy asked him, how do you, how do, you do it? How do you, how do you stay strong and keep from going crazy after something like that happened to you? Listen to what he says. We can make it through this life when we realize there's more to this life than what we see here. A third thing Jesus tells us in this parable that death teaches us about life is that what we believe about Jesus determines our eternal destiny. The writers of the Bible will not budge on this one. John says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And John says, yet to all who did receive him, Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Belief in Jesus, commitment to Christ, is what prepares us for an eternity with God in heaven. Our opportunity to trust him is right now. Jesus teaches no doctrine of purgatory or a second chance. The rich man did not get a second chance. Our years on earth present us with sufficient opportunity to decide whether we want to respond to Christ's call in our lives or not. Life is but a testing ground where we decide whether we want to spend eternity with Jesus or not. In this parable, Jesus not only tells us that life presents us with an opportunity to commit our lives to Jesus, but it gives us an opportunity to serve him. Jesus is saying there will become a time when it's too late to talk to your family or friends about Jesus. Bob Bobosky called me a couple weeks ago, and he says, you know, for years I've had a landscape company take care of our yard, and one of the landscapers is a guy named Robbie. And I've enjoyed talking to him. He's a young guy, got tattoos all over his body and, you know, piercings and jewelry. And, um, and he, he kind of opens up to me, tells me about his drug use and partying. And so I've tried to talk to him. But one thing that held me back was the thought of this guy that's landscaping my yard by day could be the guy coming back and burglarizing my house by night. And then a couple weeks ago, he got a call and said, Robbie died last night at 36 years of age. And that's when he called me and he said, nah, I wish I'd said more. I wish I'd been a little more bold. I mean, Bob realizes that this is the most fulfilling and thrilling adventure we can be involved in in our life. Talking to the Robbies in our life. And pointing them to Jesus. Is there someone in your life who, who you may be the only church going Christ follower they know? And you've been holding back talking to them because you want to be sensitive and don't want to be rude. But I'm telling you, you don't know how long they're going to live. So you don't have forever. There's another thing death teaches us about life. Our response to God's word in this world determines our destiny in the next world. 
The rich man asked Abraham to send somebody back from the dead to warn his brothers about their impending doom. Abraham said, they don't need a special messenger. They have the Bible. But the rich man objected, no, that's not enough. Send someone from the dead. We're prone to side with the rich man on this one. Yeah, certainly people will respond if they get a special visit from God. Somebody comes back from the dead. But Abraham knew better. He replied, if they don't believe the Bible, then they won't believe even if God sends them someone from the dead. How right he was. Even after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, his friend, do you think the religious leaders got on board and said, whoa, we're with you now, Jesus? No, they hated him all the more. They wanted to put him to death. And then when God raised Jesus from the dead, do you think then they got on board? No, they wanted to kill the disciples and stop the church in its tracks. Nothing would convince them. Jesus knew that a person who does not listen to God's word will not be converted even by a miracle. Have you ever thought the Bible is sure difficult to understand? I wish God would send me, you know, a miracle or some special messenger, then I would believe. Be careful. Such a view reveals that you have too low a view of the Bible. You don't understand its power and authority. Jesus says the Bible has all you need, all the evidence you need to come to faith in Christ and to follow him. Do you take time to read it? There's one more thing that death teaches us about life. Our attitudes and actions toward people in this life have a major influence on our lot in the next life. The rich man was judged for his callous insensitivity to the poor man who lay at his doorstep. Now, Jesus doesn't suggest that he did anything overtly cruel to Lazarus. His sin was that he never noticed him. He accepted Lazarus as part of the landscape. He thought it perfectly natural the inevitable that this man should be in pain and hunger while he lived lavishly. This man was not indicted for being rich. He was punished for his apathy and lack of love. The Bible makes clear that love for God and obedience to God shows itself in love for people. Do you remember our verses from John when we had our real things? What's a, what's a real Christian look like in January, February? Whoever claims to love God, this is John, yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Death can teach us so much about life. Jesus teaches us that we all have six things in common. We're all going to die. We're all going to live forever. The only question is where. We can all know about the claims of Christ to be the Son of God and only way to God. If all you knew about Jesus was what you heard me say today, you know enough to know you have to believe in Jesus and commit your life to Him to spend an eternity with God in heaven. We all have the Bible. There are Bibles in practically every hotel room across the country and practically every home in America. Our future destiny is determined by our response to it. We all have resources that can be used to help people and serve God or spent selfishly on ourselves. And we all have a limited amount of time in which to choose our destiny. Don't believe the lie that you have forever to make a decision about Jesus. The man in this parable ran out of time. The Bible says, call on the Lord while he may be found. Ty Hart's death at age 21 and the three memorial services I conducted recently of a 39-year-old man, 64 and 64, reminded me that we don't know how long we're going to live. There's no time to spare. Today is the day to decide if you believe in Jesus and are going to follow him. Today is the day to share with the family members and friends, acquaintances in your life about Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our teacher and what you teach us about life after death. And that this is serious. This is when we choose. 
So if you're here today and there's any question, if you have said, Jesus, I believe in you and I want to commit my life to you, I want to follow you. If you've never done that, I would encourage you to do that today. Maybe you've already made that commitment and the commitment you need to make today is, you know, I need to be a little more out there with my family and friends and people I know and sharing about Jesus because I don't have forever. They may not have forever. Would you pray, commit yourself either way? I'll give you just a few seconds. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us in this great parable. In Jesus' name we pray.